Alright, make sure we rock and roll. Yes. Let me, uh, yeah. let me get this all set. Thanks for coming down, man. No worries, my pleasure. No, we, we do a podcast, it's all... Um, but I don't do any of this side of it, I just chat. And it's all about authenticity, and it's chef's talk. Who does your editing and production? Um, the co-host. So I used to be a radio presenter, so we, they do all that stuff. We record it in the cookery school upstairs. There's so many things in my business, Paul, that like, I love doing, but it comes attached with a load of shit. Yeah. And podcasting is kind of one of them, like the technical stuff. and yeah and it's editing then we're working on like an intro and outro to the podcast now and yeah you know fancy Do you loading the hosting the, the everything yeah, yeah. The marketing it yeah. <laughs> it's a bit like you i guess trying to create awesome food and then trying to like do the service at the same time, make sure the restaurant's clean. Exactly. All that kind of stuff. Exactly um, that. But what I really want to like, I just want to jump in at the deep end in, how does a, how does a young lad from Coventry kind of end up owning this prestigious Michelin star restaurant? Um, through just, just will really, will just wanting to, wanting to achieve and just being damn right stubborn. Like genuinely, like I think people think I'm more stubborn than I actually am. It was genuine will and pig-headedness of just being like dogged from an early age of really wanting to to a- achieve something, and that like, it goes back to like, like there's loads of different reasons. I've done a lot of reflection on my life in the past mm-hmm. few years, trying to find who I am, where I am, where I'm going, and trying to understand the reasons of who I am, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I. I can sort of pinpoint from an early age of just this point where I was like, well, fuck everyone else, I'm going to do this on my own. I don't need anyone, I'll do it. And I just would have, I don't know, it was more about this fear of failure in that than rather than the wanting to succeed, if that makes sense. Makes total sense. When you said you wanted to do something, like when did the, like the idea of being a chef, owning a restaurant come into play? Um, when I was 10. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So I grew up in pubs in Coventry. So yeah. I've always been in hospitality and I've always enjoyed the just the feel of hospitality, yeah. that sort of family feel and then people coming in and you sort of getting closer and go to know your customers and then and then them go in and do, just being in that environment. And then there's there's loads of things wrapped up in it. So there's that. There was I, you must know the Elston Cottage in yeah. Coventry. Yeah, so I lived above yeah. there when it was oh, a live yeah. music venue and had the Swains playing yeah. and stuff. That's some good nights in there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I did and I was only 10. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, you spent a lot of time in there in my youth. But yeah. So is your, has that changed for you now? Like, do you still, I was going to ask you this later, but we might as well jump into it. Do you, do you appreciate the experience that you offer people more or is it more about the creation of food? Um, more towards the experience now I'm a, more of a restaurateur than just a chef it's, it's the whole package a lot of chefs go through their career and a lot just want to be chefs a lot of them don't even want to be head chefs they just want to cook and or it's just a job but for me it was all about creating the best food and until I became a restaurateur and you appreciate the whole package um, that you need to offer your customers sure. yeah I think I always had an understanding of that from growing up in the service industry yeah yeah. but I always wanted to be back of house but it's mad that now I'm older I enjoy the not being a waiter or a restaurant manager but I enjoy the engagement with customers mm. like I was always scared of that when I was younger because I was quite shy um, until I sort of you know, come out of myself yeah I just love like cooking in the chef's table, engaging with the guests, and having an open kitchen, and just having that sort of mm-hmm. connection between our customers yeah. as well. Do you feel lucky that you uh, like? Because a lot of the guys that I work with will talk about lack of purpose. Like, I don't know what I want to do with my life. Mm. Do you feel lucky that at such a young age you were kind of directed and maybe nudged towards doing what you do? Would you feel almost like it may have put you on a path that you hold? Hold on, I didn't necessarily choose this like I've been directed here. how do you view it now uh, yes and no really I think I don't know I always had this approach of like like I said from 10 I wanted to be a chef right um, and then from when I was about sort of around 10-ish I wanted to own my own restaurant when I was 13 I bought I had my first cookbook my mum bought me Gary Rhodes cookbook and I was like I want a cookbook. Yeah. And then when I was about 16, that was when I first heard of Michelin, so I want a Michelin star. So there's three like goals that aren't necessarily easily achieved, but I really wanted them and I was just dogged in the approach to get them and a lot of, you know, pitfalls and successes along the way. And I always thought I had this purpose, but it was quite a false sense of purpose um, that I sort of hid behind, I think. 
and then open salt in 2017 so i opened the restaurant the next year i got the star and the next year i got the book so those three goals i've been working 20 odd years towards mm -hmm. all happened within a year all the work was done to it but they just happened and i just had this really deflated moment of what the fuck now like and what's my purpose and i was going through a divorce at the time as well so mm -hmm. it was it was just like, where's my purpose? Where's my fulfillment? And you know, I struggled for a couple of years with that, really. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, there's a bit of envy there for me when I hear you say, from like the age of ten, like you, you, you know, you kind of had it mapped out between ten and thirteen. You were like, you knew the three things that you wanted. <laughs> yeah. And for me, that sounds great. Like, it makes surely it makes life easier, right? When you're like, well, from a young age, I know what I've got to do. I know what my mission is. Oh, was it? It surely couldn't have been that plain yeah, sailing, right? No, it's not at all. Because at the end of the day, like I was a kid, I didn't know what being a chef was like. Yeah. It looked kind of glamorous and cool. Like when I was at the cottage, the the guy who was the cook there. My mum did a lot of cooking, but they had a chef. He was the drummer in the band. He got the ladies, he had a big quiff, and I was like, yeah, this looks pretty cool. Yeah. Um, as well as the cooking and the fire in the kitchen and all that. Um, so I never knew what it's really like. You know, you see a bit on telly, but yeah. you don't know until you know. So I had an idea for six, seven years until I actually stepped foot into a proper kitchen. Fortunately, I did enjoy it and I did like the, the real atmosphere and the tough hours and the, yeah. you know, the boisterous environment and you know the bullying and that I didn't like, but I learned to handle and stuff. So you know, I was lucky that I didn't have this, I want to be a chef for six, seven years and all of a sudden, mm. I, experience what it was like and then I'm like shit what now so yeah fortunately it, it worked out right in that respect why is that bullying element such a like a consistent theme through like chefing like you see it like you could, let's look at it on like, Gordon Ramsay like yeah but people always think like bully abusive like it just seems like a an accepted method in yeah the industry. Like, what, what, do you I think you hear, from you hear more about it now is because people talk up now yeah. Right. It like genuinely, you know, I know a lot of people in the industry, in our level of industry, you know, we all know each other in that top one percent and it it doesn't happen very often. Right. I don't think you it know. could right now. No, not to the levels. Yeah. There's you know, it's a tough environment, sometimes it can be a toxic environment, words are said and things and it's not it's not ideal and wouldn't suit most industries and I'm not, you know, saying it's correct, but it has come on a long way. Mm. But it's like you can knock Gordon Ramsay, but you know, you've got to you've got to really look you you can't just dismiss him and say, Oh, he's a bully and he's horrible like when he when he was. You've got to look at it properly and be like, Well, why was he like that? And it's because he was treated like that and that's all he knew and he wanted to be the best and he was. You know, I've got utmost respect for him in what he's done in his career, what he's done for the industry and how he's changed. A lot of his staff stayed with him for years and that speaks volumes as well. I think it's a standards thing. I love mm. Ramsey, like, okay, you could argue maybe sometimes he gets a, you know, a bit hot head and stuff, but I love his passion. Like, you can tell he's, he's only into delivering great food, which is, yeah. again, down to the service for the customer, right? Like, yeah. So, and let's face it, we're all entertained by watching Gordon Ramsay. Like, we love that. Yeah. We love watching it. And I personally love people with who've got, like, like intense passion about something. Mm. At, like, in any trade. Like, if you love what you do, I'm like, oh, I want to I watch them. Yeah. Like, yeah, because it's, like, it's contagious as well, absolutely. isn't it? Especially if you spend time with them physically. You yeah. you absorb that. And now, when you see him on House Kitchen now, and it is contrived, it's a bit of an act, but it plays on what he used to be like. If you ever want to see the real Ramsey, like, if you go on YouTube and watch Boiling Point. Yeah. Have you seen that? No, I haven't. It's the... Is that the Steve... Are you talking about the new film? No, or is this a Ramsey? No, this was this was where it originated. So, oh, okay. 1998, the there was yeah. um, there was a Channel 4 documentary and he was opening Royal Hospital Road, which is now his three Mission Star restaurant. Right. And he'd come from the aubergine and he had... Um, he, he was on a show called Britain's Worst Bosses, right, Secret okay. Camera, <laughs> yeah. and they were like, God, this guy's fire, right? So then they spoke to him and they, they sort of like followed his launch of the restaurant and yeah. all the pitfalls and all the issues and there's cameras in the kitchen and it's, nothing's played up for, for the cameras. Okay. It's brutal, it's yeah. volatile, it wouldn't stand today and you can't necessarily defend it but it's cool watching, like chefs love it yeah. because you appreciate his passion and it was a different time yeah, we're talking over 20 years ago. It was my first year at college, 98, and I was like, wow, that's fucking mental. Yeah, but isn't that just because you strive to be at that level too? So isn't isn't like that approach, yeah, you could argue it's right, right whether it's right or wrong or not. Let's just take that out of the equation for a minute. Doesn't it just 
like narrow down the people who are deadly serious. Yeah, it does. I think so. Like he's going to create awesome chefs, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, that's he what, does. That's how I see it. Yeah, it does. And for, for me as well, you know, when, when I was first a head chef, I was fucking horrible to a lot of people. You know, I never once physical to yeah. anyone, but I was, I was hard, and I'm not now, um, because that's the way I've been taught. And I was 27 as a head chef. I had no management training mm-hmm. experience. I knew I was a leader naturally, but I never knew how to manage and coach people. So I was like fucking like volatile and reactive and you know kick off at people and I had these standards uh, but looking back at it now although I'm not like that now is it was an important thing for my career and for other people's career people that you know came on came through that but what what you have to look at that people forget is like yes we're not surgeons and we're not saving people's lives we're just cooking food but the, the dining public's changed massively over the past 20 years. You know, it used to just be we were cooking for the rich. Yeah. Now, every level of class, if you want to put it that way, eats in restaurants. They might save up, mm-hmm. might buy an outfit, they might have been looking forward to it for months. You put that pressure on yourself that you you want them to have an amazing night. And if some fuckers overcook the asparagus and split the sauce, then you, you owe that person yeah. this amazing night that they're going to remember. It's not someone who's eating out in Mission Star restaurants every week. Yeah, you know, we don't sense. have that kind of guest. And then also add to that as well, when I become a chef, that was um, become a head chef, Twitter was just kicking off. Yeah. There was no Instagram, but then there was fucking TripAdvisor as well. And if there was ever anything negative, it was never the general manager's name or the restaurant manager's name. It was me. And mm. I was like you know second third in the pecking order of these hotels it was me and it was always me so you took it personally so you do it all that you know melting pot just creates this oh no totally i can relate to what you've just said on a couple of things there so like we're we're my mum and dad live 40 minutes from stratford and Mm. we keep saying like on a special occasion when when it's a real special occasion we'll go salt yeah and when we do go it'll be a big deal because we've never had a Michelin star restaurant meal as yeah. a family it's just not what we've done you know we grew up yeah. in Carb we would you know it just weren't normal to do that <laughs> yeah, kind of thing yeah. I mean, yeah for me so you're right it will be something that we've spoke about f- for years so you kind of I think your expectations then go up yeah. So there's more pressure on everyone in the restaurant to make sure you have a great night. And I think you're going to be a bit more fussy than what you normally would be. You're going to pick out things that you might not pick out at a normal restaurant. Mm. So I think the the, the the scope to be criticised is probably much, much wider and much greater than at a normal restaurant. Exactly. How have you then, like, if you said you used to be like quite harsh with your staff, like, I used to have like 10 or 12 personal trainers work for me and I could never understand like why aren't your standards like where I want them to be and where mm. mine are how did you get past that point like how did you change your management management style to get the best out of the people that were working for you um, well I think for f- first of all what took what took a while for me to really understand and, and click with was that just remember they're not all going to be as good as you and the majority of them aren't mm. going to be and there was that that removes a lot of frustration and like why can't they cook as good as me Mm -hmm. um and i've come in from for instance i've you know michelin background all over the world and i've gone to this little corner of suffolk um beautiful little hotel and a few great guys that worked for me then are doing really well now but they'd never worked in anywhere near a standard of me but i just had this like because i've always found cooking easy Mm. and been passionate about it so why can't you do it why can't you? That's easy. And it was that frustration. Once you get past that and then you you learn how to grow a team and evolve them in the best way and promote their strengths. I don't focus too much on their weaknesses anymore. You want to improve them, but sometimes there's no point. And the same for me as well. Like I I got to a point where it was like, well, my weaknesses, certain ones of them, I can't really focus. I'm going to focus on my strengths. I might, you know, my sous chef might be better at something than me. Accept that. Let them do the things that I'm not good of. You're promoting their strengths, mm. and we together become a stronger team. What are your strengths now, like, and how have they changed? So, for example, is your main task now to keep creating great food, or is it to make sure the chefs underneath you are producing the quality of food that you would want your guests to eat? Um, yeah, now my role's changed a lot over the years. I don't cook as much anymore. I've got head chef Laura. She's been with me since day one of Salt. Um, so my job now is more tactical over the business. I'll still cook in the chef's table and I'll cook service sometimes. But one of the best things you can do when you get to that kind of level 
is leave them alone sometimes. Mm-hmm. And you'll know that is just get out of their way because yeah. people don't grow if you're in their way. Do they? You're just stopping them. You're a barrier. You know, once you trust them and you put them in certain positions, if you one, if you don't let them grow, they'll probably end up leaving to grow elsewhere. Or two, they're just going to get stagnant in where they are. So letting them thrive and giving them the freedom and the creativity to to put their own mark on salt as well. You know, because it's not all about me. It's never been all about me. It's you know, salt is a great restaurant, and the food and server has to come within the confines of what we set mm-hmm. with our brand. But within that, there's loads of freedom. And you know, I want my guys that are there now to put their mark on it, put their food on, change service elements within those boundaries to make it their own. Yeah. How old are you now? Thirty nine. I'm forty in August. Yeah. Forty in August. Yeah. So yeah, I'm thirty. I'll be thirty eight in October, and I'm starting to change the way I think as well. The first thing it took me ages to realise that not everyone's the same. Like, no one's got the same values. Yeah, it took me too long. Yeah, <laughs> to I'm still working it out. Like, yeah. I was working with a young lad this morning on some creativity, and he's he's about twenty one, I think, twenty two. He was coming up with all these ideas. I didn't have a fucking clue what he was on about. But you know what? I just said. Go and do it. Go and do your thing. Mm. Put your spin on it. Because in my instant thought is, well, no, I don't want that. I don't want this. I want it done yeah. like this. I, want... I thought, no. Like sometimes you might not know best. Yeah, you're right. And it's hard. It's it's hard, but it's quite it's quite refreshing to think like that. It's it's a bit of relief. It is. I think when you're trying to be a control freak around everything. But however, I'd argue like, do guys like yourself get to the top because they've been like that? This is where the paradox lies. It's like, mm. do you have to be obsessive and like that to get the standards? And then, like, is this the process that everyone goes through? Uh, probably in some respect, and it's definitely definitely a paradox. But for me, I think I think there's a really fine line between being in control and being a control freak. Yeah. You know, people have called me control freaks, and I will react to it because I don't think I think I'm in control. So where's the line? It's, it's hard. It's very blurred. <laughs> it's very blurred. Um, control freak is where I think where you're micromanage, micromanaging. And I was probably crossing that line a bit in the first few years of Salt. You well, know, I think that's how you find out where it is. You cross it. Yeah. You flirt with it. And then after years of playing on that line and crossing it, and you start to realise where it is a little bit better, right? Yeah, like yeah. Any area right. of life. You don't know until you've been there. I think so, yeah. Yeah, and we, we were in a place in the early days of Salt that we were so exposed, that the business was so reliant on me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I did have to uh, cross that line, I suppose, quite a lot, just to keep the business going and keep the standard right. Um, but I think if I hadn't have stepped back, because I'm mean, still in control of the business, yeah. but nowhere near control freak now because I've got really strong people that can do their jobs and I, I see it in them especially Laura you know she's been with me five years the things she says and the things she does I'm like oh that's me that is yeah, <laughs> yeah no, it's cool. like, was Michelin star always a goal of yours or did it just like if you're quite a driven guy was it always just the next like is it was just like lots of next steps got you there for me that? it was always a dream never a goal if that makes yeah. sense something yeah. I always wanted but I genuinely never thought it would happen even from like a young age you from a young age star. from 16 when I first wow. heard of what it was see that's, that's so inspiring to me that a lad at 16 can say I'm gonna or at least dream about getting a Michelin star mm. like, but you know when I got it was when I stopped focusing on it how many times do you hear this though the Tyson Furies of the world but you know I've been after this heavyweight belt for my entire life I got it the next day I'm depressed to fuck yeah how many times does that happen oh so much yeah so because it's it's this elusive thing that when it happens nothing really changes no nothing like does. really <laughs> like yeah you're immensely proud of it but you still got to get up the next day take the kids to school and stuff and you know do, on the flip do of, day to day and life admin of course and, on the flip of that though Paul does it just it, in an essence does it become more stressful and less enjoyable because now you've got this Michelin star like there's more on the line there's more expectation like, does, does it feel like that at all like, it doesn't for me star, no man? no it doesn't I think I think because I got it maybe if I'd have got it in my 20s but I was I think 35 ish something okay. like that when I got it so more mature yeah and and I think another part of the reason is I'm more grateful of it in the sense that I was head chef at Mallory Court just down the road here. We had loads of visits from Michelin and I'd had visits, visits in Suffolk and it just seemed like it wasn't happening. And I genuinely made my peace. I was like, okay, I'm going to be one of those chefs. And the chefs out there that have never got a star, but it's almost like, how? I don't get it. And I just thought I fell into that category. And I, I was fine with it. I'd accepted it. We opened Salt, and it was never part of the business model. Again, something I wanted, 
but I never spoke about it with the team. I wasn't like, well, we've got to cook this to get a star. We've got yeah. to do this to get a star. It's like, let's create a great restaurant and we're going to cook the food I want to cook and we want to cook. I don't give a fuck. I, I don't believe in the customer's always right at all. Like, customer is very rarely right. Like, genuinely, oh, it's, this is my business. There's no need for my restaurant in Stratford upon Avon. It's, um, it's for me something we wanted to create. Right, we're not there to feed the public. We're there to give an experience, and we offer the experience. It's not just you come to see Shakespeare and let's get a bit of food. So it has to be exactly what we want to do. And if we don't want to do, it, we won't do it. So we we had that sort of range, and it's like let's just get the best ingredients, cook the best food, with the most relaxed but professional service, and we focused on that because. Like going back to what I was talking about earlier, like wanting a star from sort of 16 when I first heard of it. That's not why I became a chef. I had to remember the reasons why I became a chef. It was like pleasing people, like the buzz of the kitchen and creating great food. I'd wanted to do that six years before I heard Michelin. So that's what the restaurant model had to be about. And because we did that, we didn't focus on Michelin. It, like, it happened, it just happened because we were focused on our customers and our food and the people that valued what we do. What a great lesson in there, though. I've, yeah. spent the, I've spent the most of this year going back to why did I get into what I was doing because it's so easy that you get lost. Mm. I think fina finances play a bit of a role. So yeah, yeah. Especially when you've got staff, you've also got wages, pressures, and you start to focus on you know, profit. We need to make this amount of money. Yeah. And that got into me quite a bit. And I, I started to strip away all this stuff and started to go, Alex, what, why, why did you even start working for yourself and doing what you do? Yeah. And it's took me right back to square one. And half of it's humbling because I'm like, fuck, I'm going to have to start again, kind of. Like, mm. I'm going to have to reassess my, you know, the way I do things. Uh, but the other half is is great. It's it's um, given me an, a new kind of impetus to, to continue doing what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. So I had to check in with why I got started again. I think yeah. most businessmen, business women, have the same thing. They kind yeah. of like, you know, they suddenly wake up and they go, how did I get here? Stressed yeah. as fuck, busy it, as hell, you know, dealing with staff issues. And you're like, why, why did I even get into it? Yeah, it is. You get, and reflection's so important. Yeah, you to said realize the start, why we're doing it. Like yeah. You went through this phase of kind of like, well, not phase, but a you know, time of reflection of like, yeah. who am I, what am I doing? Uh, wh when was this? Like, was this, this after the was, Michelin star? So I got the Michelin star, it was like October 2018. <coughs> yeah. Um, the restaurant opened the year before, and I'd already written my first cookbook. Um, and that came out in November 2018. So these massive, for me, massive things, achievements, like lifetime goals or dreams that I had, all happened so close together uh, after being a chef from 16. So like... 20 years mm. and it was it was overwhelming and I, I couldn't focus on it or enjoy it or um, really take it in mm. because I was having personal issues and like I said divorce at the time um, so it was almost like that was kind of shelved and because I had to focus on my personal life and then you know, that led to me just sort of being completely lost having loads of therapy and really mm. trying to find out who I was and why I had such self-esteem issues, why I was so low and what my issues were. And it was my ex-wife who really sort of pushed me to go and get the therapy because I couldn't see anything. I was just, um, you know, just this brick wall in front of me and I was just, I was fine. You know, I like, you know, with, because I never really had like depression or anything. I had other issues, but, you know, it, it generally people know and they'll, they don't want to talk about it. They'll say, I'm fine. But for me, I genuinely was. I was just that blind to what I was sort of outlaying that I couldn't even see it. So, you know, it was from going to therapy, I really found out like, well, where am I going? What what What's this like treadmill that I'm on? Like I've, I've achieved these things, everything, but everything seems to be going wrong and I couldn't really put it together. Do you know what I mean? Like on the surface, and everyone's coming to me, oh, you're doing so well, everything's amazing. And, and so I'm like, it's fucking not really, is it? Like, because nothing's, uh, nothing's changed for the better for me. And that's what, and I just couldn't make any sense of it at all. And it took a couple of years to really understand where I was, where I'd come from, the reasons I was, you know, going that way. And then, you know, really now over the past sort of two years, I've just been more at peace with it. So what kind of um, led you to get therapy? Like something must have happened or there must have been a big stumbling block for you to decide to go and do that because for, for a guy that's pretty 
pretty big deal. Yeah. Yeah, like what, what happened to tip you towards that direction? Um, it was, it, was, it was listening to my ex-wife. She was telling me that I needed to. And I wasn't closed mind to it in the sense that like, I don't need it and being like blocking it. I genuinely thought I was fine. Like, I, I said, all right, I'll go along. Like, it's, this is happy. Yeah, 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 I'll keep, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'll do it because this isn't going to be a bad thing. It's not going to be a good okay. thing. I'll just go. Yeah. Why not? After a, after a good bit of time. And then, yeah, like first session, just, it was mad, just broke down. And then, really? yeah. yeah. And then it was like you know, a good year or so of just unpacking all sorts of shit to get to a point where it's like, okay, now we can deal with the shit. Yeah. You know, well, it took a lot longer than perhaps it could have. I know there's no sort of pattern for it, but because obviously, you know, going through the divorce at the time and, you know, being so stressed and busy with the restaurant and then, you know, just hitting this point of like, well, I've achieved all my goals what do I do now? Like, what's what's the point sort of thing? Well, you know, do worse. I want to be a chef? And I knew I was, you know, the wrong side of 30 and like, you know, two young kids and I don't want to be at that restaurant every, as much as I love the restaurant mm-hmm. every Friday, Saturday night because I just don't, when I get to 40, I don't want to. I want to be able to step back from the business, let the guys run it and just have some time. Therapy and working on the mindset for me, I always say to my guys, look, if you stop going to the gym, for example, like your muscles are going to shrink a little bit and you're not going to be as strong. Mm. I treat therapy now on this mindset game a bit like the gym. Like I have to do certain things every week mm. to not only stay on top of my game, but to keep moving forward as well. So yeah. what happened then over those two years or even in that first session that like struck you that you didn't know about yourself? Like what what's led to all this change? What has changed? Like, what did you learn from the two years of therapy? Well, it just, um, it's mad. And it sounds cliche when you, you talk about it, but it's the childhood state and the things that you you witness and experience as a child and how powerful they are to who you are as an adult. Like, without going, I don't want to go into too much detail about it, but you know, like my personal father figure issues mm-hmm. um, and me just struggling and not knowing what a man was or should be. I don't like the word should, but I think, yeah, it's, it's the only one I can use in this mm-hmm. sort of conversation. Um, and just being totally lost. And it was like there was, you know, we can always pinpoint this age point from when I was 15. And that was when I did, I shut down my emotions. So much so that nobody could ever tell if I was ever happy, sad or, or anything. Um, but it wasn't like I was just hiding this, hiding a depression or something. It was... I didn't even know myself how I was feeling. I was that like numb that I couldn't express to anyone how I felt about anything really. It took a point that, you know, if somebody would buy me a nice Christmas present, I'd feel guilt and I'd just like like wife at the time she'd buy me a nice gift or something and I'd she'd always say, You just seem so ungrateful when you get a present. I said, like, oh, no, no, I am. But it was like this guilt of like I don't deserve it and that was like my self esteem being so low that I don't deserve these nice things. Um, and that that's where the issues were all wrapped up in and like, it's such a better place now from dealing with it and I'd say to anyone even if you genuinely are okay get therapy because it's the best thing anyone can do back you up on that one I think yeah. That's a, yeah I think that's a, a good yeah. suggestion I think one of the challenges is uh, one knowing how you feel so like mm. you just said like I think we've become so conditioned we don't even know how we feel so yeah. if you said to me today Alex how do you really feel I'll be like I'm all right, I don't know. Just, yeah, I just don't yeah. know. And then two, I think it's articulating mm. how you feel as well. Yeah. I think that's difficult because feelings are a hard thing to describe. Like they're yeah. a hard thing to make sense in your head, especially for men of our generation because you're not encouraged, you no. know, and no. you're just not. And I've, I've got a son who's five, and like, it's amazing. He's so in touch with emotions, which is brilliant. Like he's more in touch with his than I am now. And just the, the way he can articulate it, I think is fantastic. Um, I think partly because, you know, like me and like the mom, we've got a great relationship still. We get on and we co-parent really well. Yeah. Um, but like coming out of the issues we've had, it's been like, okay, let's try and encourage them to be able to express themselves, you know, both my daughter and my son. Mm. And, you know, I don't want that whole stigma of, you know, boys not being allowed to just talk about it but girls can so what kind of impact did it have on your relationship then when you were that closed off (coughs) like 
is that one of the reasons why the the, the relationship didn't work out? Like, yeah, big yeah. reason. Yeah, 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 big reason. I, you know, I know my part to play in it. Um, you know, it was never, I never wronged, I never did anything wrong. But it was, you know, I know the parts I did where I'd, you know, subconsciously, I suppose, removed from the relationship because I was so just closed up and. You know the way my way of sort of dealing with stuff then, which again was totally subconscious, was like throwing myself into work and be busy. And you tell yourself, I'm doing this for the family. Mm -hmm. I, and you know, yeah, a big part of it I was, but a big part of it I was hiding, you know, or you know, and you end up sacrificing yourself. And I lost even more of myself, so I worked so much, I'd have two days off, which is two nights off in my industry, so I'd have or three we had when we opened Soul, so have Sunday night off and then Monday, Tuesday. And then rather than try and reconnect and rebuild the relationship, um, I would be, oh, right, I've got to do stuff around the house. I've got to be the man of the house. I've got to be doing chores and jobs and admin. So I'm further removing myself from the relationship, I suppose. And, you know, also then, you know, I'd never had any time for myself at all. And that was an active decision because I wanted to, um, I had this guilt of like, okay, I've worked four or five nights this week. I'm not going to go and see my mates because you'll be at home on your own again. And then all of a sudden I'm not doing anything for myself. Although the work from my ex's point of view, work was my own thing. So it looked selfish, mm. if that makes sense, where I was working, no time for me, no time. And I was like, I don't need it. I don't need my time. It's fine. I don't need me time. And like now, it's one of the best things I do is have time for myself. It's amazing. Yeah. You know, I've got a girlfriend now and she's great. And, you know, you don't. I don't have to set boundaries with her because of the place I'm at and my understanding of myself. Um you know, I just have this time to myself and I don't feel guilt like I have to be with her. I'll have a night to myself or a day to myself or go out and go go and eat or go and see friends. And it's just a much more positive place. I'll go out on my bike, I'll exercise, I'll just sit in the house and chill and drink whiskey and listen to music. Like, and that's so powerful, just being able to do that to yourself rather than restricting your own needs. Absolutely. Do you think this came off the back of hitting all of your goals and then thinking, well, I've, I've done everything I set out to and I still don't feel like something's quite right? Was that was that a good thing for you that you hit all those things in one go and it left you with like, well, what the fuck do I do now? I think that was more coincidence. I think it was more the personal issues I've in that forced right. me through therapy yeah. and then, you know, you, we dealt with everything. I think it would have been a l much more long-winded process had it just been about those, those goals because you could kind of handle it all together like you know i'd just i'd go into your therapy sessions just be like i don't i don't know what the fucking point is like mm. what why why am i doing this like and i wasn't getting any fulfillment and again like people would say these things to me like the therapist that's what are your needs i'm like i don't know well, fucking nobody's ever asked me that <laughs> and what are your wants and understanding the difference between wants and needs um and what do you get fulfillment of and we dive deep into that and the only thing in my life I got fulfillment was, was hanging out with my children that was it um, yeah and it was you know those things were really powerful to realise and then build upon and I think like what I always felt it was quite selfish to be like well these are my needs I was like no I'm not no, I'm not going to be a selfish husband <laughs> I'm not going to be a selfish guy mm. I, I, my needs don't matter and that's what you tell me my needs don't matter but, but they do everyone's do and I didn't think mine did so what have you done specifically different then? So in order to build self worth up and to for life to be more filling, fulfilling, yeah. Like what have you specifically done since you've had therapy? Like how's life different now to what it used to? Be? Well, you know, lockdown helped. Yeah. Because it was just stop. Okay. Like okay, fuck. <laughs> mm. Like I've never stopped mm. like ever, and you know I moved back into the family home for a bit, like back a lot on the sofa, so I could support with the kids. Um, because I didn't have anywhere to live at the time. I was living above the restaurant before, um, just before lockdown. So I went back in, I was there for most of the week and then stayed at the restaurant. Well, because she like works in the police, so she had to work throughout lockdown. Um, so I'd be there supporting the kids and I just, I had no, nothing to do. Like, so I could just be and be present. And that's what I'd always struggled with. I never realized I was always, if, I was with people, it was not like social media. My head was distracted. I was thinking about the restaurant. I was never present. I was worried about the past or the future. And like, and I've realized now that like the past and the future are bullshit. Like they're not real. 
their, that their memories and dreams. The only thing that matters is the present, right? Because that's all there is. So being present and just being able to be and then accept that is like been so powerful to me. And lockdown did did help with that at first. It took a while to adjust, but you know, my I've got always a list on my notepad that you, it's just never done. And you must know the same. You're like you cross jobs off, and then you're adding more, and it's just constant evolving. I've got used to my life being like that, but I just didn't have that even. And it was like, what do I actually do? And I just you know, just just did and it's hard to sort of quantify it into words but i was i was present and engaging and you know really learn what was valuable and important well that slowing down process is kind of like what i had to force myself to do as well because when you hustle 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 all the time yeah you haven't even got a minute to contemplate what the fuck's going on let alone change it so the i think the awareness thing is what a therapist can also help do like so they ask you questions that as a guy You've never been fucking asked. Your mates don't ask you, like, you know, what do you need? Mm. But you just wouldn't ask that down the pub with your mates, would you? No. It, it, you just don't have that conversation. No, no, you don't. So even that alone, it's, it's quite exciting, though, when you're going into conversations that you've never had before, especially if you're someone who enjoys conversation. I love conversation, clearly. I'm, mm. I do this. And I love talking about things like this that would probably never get said. Yeah. I don't think we'd be having this conversation if I saw you at Salt and we just grabbed 20 minutes. And mm. We'd be talking about the restaurant and food and that only. Yeah, yeah, superficial level of yeah, stuff. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And again, it's that identity thing. It's like Paul mm. Foster, owner of Salt, and you'd be like Alex Myers, you know, owner of Better Man. Mm. And that's probably as far as it would go. Yeah. That's why I love these conversations because you start to get into the surface and learn about things. I think exactly. it's important for guys like yourself because you, like, clearly you're successful, right? You've done well, mm. like, really fucking well. Like say, lad from Coventry, like myself, you've gone on and created this Michelin style restaurant. But I'm more interested in like the fucking ugly stuff in the middle of that. Yeah, because that's more relatable. Yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah, and it's it's really authentic, yeah. isn't it? It's real and it's more inspiring for me personally. And it's relatable for everyone. Isn't I think it? so. I think so because it would be easy. Like if you you know, I did my research on you, of course, and it's but it's all the like all the places you travelled, all the great chefs you've worked and, mm. uh, and I was like, there's got to be more to the story. Yeah, like, there's none, like, of, my dirt, easy, none you know? of my dirty laundry's out there, nothing. Oh. It's just, just don't, even though I'm very active on social media, it's never personal. Mm. Yeah, never really what's, really what's going on in my life and uh, I just don't, yeah, I don't want to do that. Although I'm quite open yeah. and love conversations like this and you know, really grateful you asked me to be on this so, you know, it's, it's so good to talk. Mm. Um, there's, uh, there's, a place and a time and a platform and I'm still working out where that is and I think a lot of people are like the right time to talk and you know one thing that you know just reminded me now is that I think is so important I always promised myself I'd do more of and I don't do enough of is just is going to friends and just asking just how are you mm -hmm. like that sort of thing and I, I it's something I need to do more of because that was asked of me and you know the whole thing and one one thing that really i've always struggled with and it gets my back up a bit is when you know with you know depression in men and, and men, mental illness um the 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 when people say oh, well you need to talk to someone and that's such a dismissive statement because they can't some of them don't know they've got issue some of them physically cannot fucking bring themselves to do it and some of them can't articulate it and they go down the wrong path um and yes, they need to talk, but it's dismissive to say, you should have talked to someone, you need to go and talk to someone. Mm -hmm. It's like, they probably want to deep down, but they can't. It, the most powerful thing anyone could do is you approaching them. You know, a really good friend of mine, so Simon, who is a co-host of our podcast, um, he just, I think he just picked up and we weren't, we hadn't been mates for years and years, so he sort of knew me on a different level, like through the restaurant and then getting to know me. And it, I think he just picked up on me changing and um, I, I couldn't, he'd probably be able to say more what it was. And he just, he just messaged me. He's like, you're not all right, are you? Let's go for a pint and we'll talk about it. And we just went for a pint and yeah, I just broke down and mm. um, it took stuff like that, people reaching out to me for me to be able to vocalize and articulate. Do you think that was the way he framed that message, though? So if he'd have said, Paul, are you all right? You'd have just replied, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine mate. Or, yeah, I'm going for a bit of a shit time, but I'll be fine. The fact that he said, Paul, you're not all right. Let's go for a pint. Yeah, it's quite I a different so. message, isn't it? It really is, yeah. Yeah, and he, he's very good at talking mm. and understanding people as well. So, you know, it's something he's got, he's really skillful at. 
Um, and probably the fact that um, we probably didn't talk huge amounts at the time, so it was kind of out of the blue, and it, it makes it feel more authentic. You know, like if you if you have a mate who you know is struggling, if you phone them every day, you're right, you're right, it would become a bit numb. I think perhaps because he's slightly outside of my friendship group, and he come in, he'd notice something, and it just took me off guard, like, oh, fuck, he's noticed I'm not. And then, yeah. And I was already having therapy at the time, and she was encouraging me to speak to people, but I still couldn't. I still couldn't. Only her, really. I was really disappointed with the whole mental health drive of, like, just speak to anyone. At one stage, it was like, even the guy down the, the local booze or at the pub, just go and speak to people. And I was like, it's the hardest thing in the world. When it you, is. But men struggle is with vulnerability. Of course they do. I'm not going to go up to a, a, any any old person. Mm. In fact, I'm not probably going to go to to many people at all. But the other skill is being on the end of that. So I think who you speak to is just as important. Mm. I reached out to someone recently, and it was the wrong person to reach out to. Because mm. listening to someone's deep internal problems is not comfortable. Mm. So if I came to you without any word, uh, word of warning and just spilled everything onto you, that's, yeah. a, that's a challenge for you to deal with as well. Yeah, it's not just it me, is. you know. And it might have took me months and months to come and say this shit to you, and then you're just like, "What the fuck do I do with this?" Mm. It's a two-way thing. That's why I think it's really it's a skill of like, who who can I speak to? This is yeah. why I think therapy might be the way for most. Yeah. But are men going to do therapy? Let's face it. Like, how many men would put their hands up and go, "I'll go therapy." Yeah, it's going to be such a fucking small percentage. Like it's a voluntary, yeah, it's going to be. It's, it's going to be, and as well, you can't just go and talk to anyone because, through no fault of their own, not many people are good listeners. I definitely wasn't a good listener because, I, you know, a tra- another trait of a man is to be a fixer, right? So if you know, if my ex-wife was having issues, come and talk to me, and you're trying to solve it, you want to solve the problems, which, from a, it comes from a good place, and you're wanting to solve that for them, but. It took me a long time to realise that they don't need you to solve the problems, they just need you to be present in here. Or another thing that I'd do is while they're talking, you're thinking of the solve and you're thinking of the next question. And while you're thinking of that, you're not actually listening, are you? So like, I learned the art of proper conversation, listening to people mm. and then responding and not just trying to solve their problems. Because again, that's so dismissive. If I come to you and you know, I know that we don't know each other, we've just met today and I like, Give a give you a problem. What it is, it's a warning sign of like I want, I want to talk. I don't want you to come and fix everything. If you just fix it now, then I feel like I've been dismissed, and that's what people feel, isn't it? When they're trying to outlay the problems, they don't necessarily want you to come. Magic one, fix this, fix that. They 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 haven't been heard. They've just been dismissed, and it you know learning that, and I, I still slip back in sometimes with listen to people, and I can. But what I'm aware of it now, and I'm aware of the power of it. You think you're listening, you think you're helping, but you're not. That's a great point, man. This is what I'm working on now. Obviously, doing the podcast, I'm in a lot of conversation. This is why I love face to face meetings. Mm-hmm. It's easier for me not to get the like, what am I going to ask next? Yeah. Whereas on Zoom, I don't know why. I don't know why. It's just a different form of communication. I'm always thinking like, what's the next question whilst the guest is speaking? And I have to remind myself just listen. It will, you know, a conversation is just just dancing. Just, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Whereas, yeah, I think the face-to-face works a bit better. When was the last time one of your mates like texted you or called you and said, Paul, I don't feel good? Man. It's not happened. It's not happened to me, really. It's not happened. Me and some of my friends, we've talked. Um, like, I'm much more open now and I can talk to them and try and get things out of them, but it's only like, when they're drunk, really. And we're, you know, we might... You know, be back at my flat or at their house, and you know they they're in their safe space and they're comfortable to talk, um, and they try and follow up the next day, and it doesn't really go anywhere. Um, but yeah, it's never happened. I what about you? It's worse the next day. Like you're right, guys open up after a skinful, but then I think they shut off even further with the beer fear and all beer that. Beer fear, yeah. the hangover, the depression that mm. comes with it, and the, and almost the guilt and shame of the fact that they brought it up. So now it's this yes, little you're right. and it gets yeah. pushed down. But yeah, in terms of when the last person asked me, no, nah. even in the even in the field that I do, but I think I might have been guilty in the especially in the past of what you've already mentioned, trying to fix because mm. I, I thought that was the best way I can help. Look, yeah, dude, you just you know you just need to get yourself down the gym, eating well, form direction, do this, do this, do this. Yeah. And now I kind of understand it's that's not what they needed. It's a learning process. This is what it's I mean. Not. Listening is hard. 
Yeah. Listening is hard. And to step back, like we spoke about at the very start, we don't always know what's best for that person either. Yeah. Just being there and listening is, is a great skill. And it's one of the best gifts you can give someone, I think. Yeah. And some of the skills I've acquired, and it's not a formula, and it's not something that do this, it works every time, but to help me be a better listener, I'll, I'll, I'll do a few things. So, like, for one, I listen to what they're actually saying. And then, two, if it's something bad, if it's something that they're struggling with, you ask them a question, how did that make you feel? Don't answer them, don't solve it, don't don't fix it, don't do anything, just, and how did that make you feel? Or repeat the last part of it with a question, so whatever it may be, um, or, God, that must have been really shit, and, or, and, but repeating what, the last part of what they've said with it. Again, they're, they're feeling listened to, they're feeling engaged, sometimes I might automatically start feeling better and then they're going to share more because they're, they're actually listening to me they've heard what I've said and they're present in this conversation at what point though is too much spilled onto you so if you had like three or four friends coming to you saying Paul my life's <laughs> fucking terrible I feel depressed like at what point does that start to kill you and eat away at you oh for, well I don't know how long is a piece of string really um, <laughs> it's totally relative isn't it to you, your situation, your friends, and I oh know I think I'm a long way off that point being fed up for it because it'd be great if a friend did. And not that you want them to be struggling, but you know, you want them to be able to come and talk to you, right? Um, yeah, so it'd be difficult to say was what is too much and what would be too much of a bearing on you. Is, but I yeah. think, like, even with therapy, that's kind of what like that's the guilt I have even going into therapy I'm like this person has to listen to people and in my head this is what I'm saying piss and moan or fucking <laughs> yeah so yeah the last thing I want to been do, there yeah, do you know what I mean? yeah so I'm like I just feel guilty even though I'm paying this person mm. who's, it's their career and their job for, to listen to my problems I still feel guilty and put my problems on this therapist and that comes from a deep rooted place of you know the 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 what we've been told therapy is through our years growing up it was for for mental people or for ill people it was always frowned upon wasn't it so did that, like, i'm just assuming i'm not telling you yeah, you have think, to be, but you for have to me, be mad to go yeah. to therapy yeah that was the score back yeah. in my, my childhood yeah if you went to therapy you you were fucking mad yeah, yeah it was like oh one. guess yeah. who's in therapy <laughs> like you know talk yeah. of the town wouldn't yeah. it um but and i certainly felt like that the first probably I'm trying to think how long I did it for. It's probably close to two years, to be honest. Um, you know, like filtered it out after a while, and you know, it had it less regular. But um, yeah, I was definitely in that way. I didn't tell anyone for the first six months, and then I managed to open up to. I think it was some of my staff first, like um, so. Laura was my head chef now. You know, I explained to her the issues that are happening because you know, my ex-wife she's still a business partner and so still involved. So it's important that they understood what was going on yeah. with us. And yeah, I was just like told her. I like, just I think I'd had a few beers and just told her. Uh, yeah, I was in therapy and just the reaction was just really nice. And I felt as well probably this like bullshit macho thing of me on on the boss. And I don't want you to see me vulnerable because well, vulnerable to me always meant weakness. So I never understood what it meant, and it's not really. It's being able to be vulnerable, and being being vulnerable is a good thing. You know, sometimes it's a powerful thing, and let it brings people closer to you if you can show vulnerability. Well, it's certainly the bravest thing. Yeah, yeah. So this is what I've just got my head around. Like it takes a really strong, courageous man to allow himself to be vulnerable. It does. It's fucking hard. And. Yeah, no, it is. really. I mean, really hard, especially in a relationship. Yeah, if you put your heart on the line and give someone your heart, pretty much what you're saying is, "Here I am." Yeah, and if you want to be really vulnerable, you have to show them like not the good sides as well. Yeah. So my biggest issue is I don't want anyone to see me in the power of not being strong, in the position yeah. of not being strong. Yeah, that's like, what I built my business on. It's my identity. I was Mr. Dis People used to call me Mr. Discipline because I'd yeah. up at four thirty gym. <laughs> And like, but the thing was like, <coughs> any girlfriend that I've had in the past has been attracted to that quality. Oh, I love your ambition, I love your drive, I love your determination. So I'm scared to let any of that go. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, right, I've got to keep that up. Mm. And then it becomes tiring, because yeah. you know, I've got to be that, that Mr. Discipline guy all the time, you know? Yeah. Lying on the sofa with ice cream, I feel <laughs> fucking guilty about yeah. this. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It was just like yeah. a little bit of an act. I was like, I'm not always like that at all. Yeah, and do you still struggle with showing that vulnerability? Oh, massively, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's yeah, yeah. Me too, yeah. Yeah. What I've what I've noticed is I, I've spent years doing this self development game, 
and I've improved so many areas of my life, so many. But the the real ugly stuff is still there. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But I'm what I've done now, Paul, which has really helped me, I've stopped trying to fight it as hard and I'm trying mm-hmm. to use it to my advantage. So we talked earlier about the why of your business. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm a bit of a realist. I've always grown up like loving depressing films, dark music, dark <laughs> I'm just drawn to that. Like, yeah. It's what I love. Like, you know, I'll sit there listening, like you said, with, with, a, with a beer to Johnny Cash Hurt, right? And I yeah. love it. So I know there's darkness in the world. Like, my friends lost their daughter to leukemia. My mate had a brain tumor. I know there's ugly things happening. Like, mm-hmm. you only have to look around. So I thought, well, rather than deny that, what I'll do is I'll take that and I'll take all the dark shit in me and I'll understand it and I'll mm-hmm. accept it. And I'll make it my job to make someone's life just a tiny bit better. Even yeah. if it's just for a, a minute or an hour mm. or a day. So I'll do charity work, I'll do events, I'll do podcast talks, mm. I'll do seminars and talks. Because it might make someone's day who's going for a real shit time. Yeah. Just for that moment, it might make their life better. Yeah. And I thought, that's my fucking why. Yeah. That's it. That's yeah. why I do it. Because I know the world can be tough and people struggle. So if I can make their life a tiny bit better. Yeah then that's my only fucking job. And it makes my life better. That's good. And there's nothing wrong with feeling good from doing that, you know. Sometimes in society we're guilted for, you know, doing good things because it makes you feel good. Obviously there's a limit and a line to it, but there's nothing wrong with feeling good for doing charitable causes or or helping somebody. There's nothing wrong with feeling good from that because it's a good thing. It is a good thing. There's a guy who you, you probably know who I'm talking about. He um, up the high street uh, by Greg's and McDonald's. His name's Marcus. He always sits there, and, and you know he's he's kind of got nowhere else to go. And he yes, just, yeah, I know the guy. Yeah, yeah, you know, one of my favourite parts of my day is when I buy him a Greg's cup of tea. Yeah, I don't know why, and I, it took me about a year to work out why do you get such pleasure from buying this guy because you're not solving his fucking problem. Mm. You're not helping him. You're not getting him off the street and into a job. You're not doing any of that. But just for 10 seconds, like, mm. I'd buy him a Belgian bun and a cup of tea. Yeah. And for a second, he'd smile. Yeah. Just a second. Yeah. And as soon as I left, though, it, it, you know, he's no fucking better off, really, once he's at his Belgian bun. Yeah. So, like, in the bigger picture, that's not really helped him. But just yeah. for a second, man. Yeah, it's exactly. Such a good just feeling. nothing out of your day. No, same, I, it must be the same guy. But I... Um, Sometimes driving into a restaurant a bit earlier, I'd stop and get a coffee. And rather than pay money to the council and pay a thing, because they're savage, the the inspectors in Stratford, <laughs> didn't they? Yeah. They love the game, don't they? <laughs> they do. <laughs> um, I'm not fucking paying. I'm going to be here five minutes. But it only cost me about 20p for a six-minute thing. Yeah. But I'd rather give him a couple of quid and just be like, you just watch me car, mate. And yeah. then while going and get a coffee, always ask him, but he'd never That's want nice. anything. Yeah. And yeah, it cost me more, but he, he, I don't know, there was just this little perk in him um, that he had the, it just uh, just for a minute, a little bit of purpose. Yeah. And he'd come in, I'd wait for my coffee at Starbucks, and he'd be like, oh, down the road, mate, yeah. And so he'd give, give me a little heads up. Oh, a legend. You yeah, know. it makes me laugh. He has a Belgian burn, coffee with four sugars, and occasionally he asked me to get him a green monster. <laughs> Part of it is the PT wants to go, you know there's a lot of sugar. In the <laughs> Shouldn't fuck up, like, this is his highlight of his day but yeah. like, little, there's clues in our actions isn't there if you're doing something and it lights you up yeah like, you need to pay attention to that i always mm-hmm. say this to the guys that i coach i like the answers are there fellas it's like when you're doing things that aren't the right thing mm-hmm. like it will bring your energy down when you're doing things that really inspire you your energy will go up yeah so i think if we're aware we can we can pick out from our day like oh doing this podcast look at my energy mm. it's through the roof yeah you must fucking love that yeah. And there's things like I was doing some social media posts earlier. Oh, come on, Alex, just just do one more post. And, <laughs> do you know what I mean? There's evidence there for what we truly love and what we don't. And I yeah. think for me anyway, the why goes back to keep trying to make as much of your life doing those things that make you feel inspired. And you, you're right, you've got to listen to your body. Your body is physically telling you in your stomach that that felt good. And yes. you're getting, I don't know about hormones, endorphins or whatever it is, you're getting a buzz from it you listen to your body and do the things that feel right and feel right for a reason but you won't get that unless you slow down yeah like that's what the covid thing did for me as well my gyms had to shut okay so i was like okay like you it was like stop mm. and then yeah uh, even in the morning now i don't put any digital media in my ears for like an hour and a half so no because i have music on all the freaking time mm. no music nothing and suddenly i can i can actually hear what's going on yeah it's weird mate it's like for the first time it in a long time I, I can listen to some of my thoughts and feelings mm. it's weird it's like there's some connections going on and if anything's out of sync 
you just get a bit fucked up and lost, don't you? But yeah. if you slow down, like, you, like clearly you've been doing the work over the last few years, you probably know that actually I enjoy these things, I enjoy that, this is important to me, so I need to, to factor that into my life. I can't yeah. carry on just running away and hiding from it. Yeah. Um, and alcohol and work is the easiest and best thing to run to. It is, and you're totally right. And we, going back to what you just said about like not having the digital media the first thing in the morning, like I used to think me time was maybe like I'd have the football on, but I'll be on my phone as well. That's not me time. You're not with yourself. Mm. Like I started cycling in the lockdown and like really enjoyed it, but I'd have podcasts on and stuff, and which are great and really important thing for me. I engage well with podcasts. I think they're a really good medium. Yeah. Um, but then there was another time I did, it was last year actually, I did a like 60 mile ride, the longest I'd done. Um, and I hadn't charged my headphones and I was like, oh, fuck, what am I going to do? And it was great, to be honest with you. I was out like eight hours yeah. and just with me, without music, without a podcast, just out on the roads all around, like from Coventry to the Cotswolds, all around the Cotswolds and that. And it was just me and I was on my own, like no no one else talking in my ear mm. and it, it, it really that's how to truly be on your own and you know, you've got to be to be comfortable in love you've got to be happy with yourself you've got to love yourself it's not about narcissism it's about genuinely loving who you are accepting who you are which I, I just didn't for a long time do you think that's a good indication of how happy you are with yourself then you know if you're always needing something some form of distraction some form of mm. input do you think that's a good sign? Because I know that I, I struggle with that, like, mm. just sit still for 10 minutes, Alex. What mm. do you mean? No TV, no music on in the background. Do you think that's a bit of an indication of, look, there's some work to be done here, you need to, to be okay with, with spending time with yourself? Yeah, and, it, it, you know, I think we need to. You can't do it all the time. You, you would go a bit mad, wouldn't you? But um, I think if you genuinely cannot beside yourself, I think that's where that's a flag that you, there's an issue there, and you need to you need to be okay with yourself. You need to be able to because without all this digital media and all these distractions we've got, you know, a few years ago we never had them. We wouldn't have had the option. We would have just had channel one, two, three, or four, and f one, two, three, and four when we grew up, wouldn't it? That was it. Was it. Um, it was, yeah. Yeah. You know, remember when Channel Five came out? It was a big deal. It was. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. Like a big announcement. It's how we're all waiting. Spy Skills launched it. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. I remember that. I was thinking, yeah, it was a big deal. Yeah. Big deal. You're right. There's so much more. Right? So I mean, much more. That. We never, never used to. So we used to, we used to have to be all right with ourselves. Um, you know, not blaming all that technology. A lot of us, me myself, get wrapped up way too much in it. Um, and it's a distraction and I still do now you know I still do now but I'm of aware of it um, but yeah you have to you have to be able to be okay with yourself because what else is there really well, I say you like you wake up with yourself you eat with yourself you go on holiday with yourself I just got back from Iceland I was in Iceland for six weeks and the first week that I was there was so depressing because I was like I've travelled all this way here I've come like for six weeks mm. I made a pact that I'd have no TV when I was there mm. And I just suddenly realised I'm still with myself. Yeah. I know that's a weird thing to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I thought, and again, like this subconsciously, I thought once I got there, everything would be all right. Yeah. Yeah, I bet you did. Yeah. yeah and I got there and I thought, Alex, you're still with you. Were you, were you looking for an escape? I think it was yeah. a bit, but it was that quiet time that you said. Yeah. So for me, sometimes it's quite painful removing old parts of yourself and giving things up because, you know, they're part of you, or you feel like they're part of you. Do you know what I mean? So when when it comes time to change, change is really hard. Mm. Like it's really hard because for for a new for something new to grow, something's got to die. So you can't be the old Paul and the new Paul at the same fucking time. Like take your pick, which one yeah. do you want to be? So the the Paul that you are now, like the old Paul's had to, have, you know, he's had to have gone somewhere, right? Yeah. And that's hard to remove the old Paul. It is. To say, still, no, you ain't doing still no jumping now and again. Yeah, exactly. Of course, <laughs> and they still flash up, right? Yeah. But that, yeah, that's why change is so difficult, yeah. It is, yeah. You know, we protect is. our old ways because it's comfortable, it's known, and it's who we think we are, and it's these values that might have been installed into us. So to go all through that is real painful. And, yeah, most people, unfortunately, they won't they won't see it through. It's too hard. It is hard. It is hard. Really and hard. I think the thing you've got to realise, whether you're at the start of the journey, you're not doing it, um, you're in the journey, there's no end to the journey is what you can realise. <laughs> no, no, and I think there's no the mistake okay. people make. They think it's like a destination. Yeah, there's no, I'll go therapy. Right, okay, we'll do a um, six-month plan. 
everything will be honky dory. <laughs> like you will, you know, you hopefully will come out with better tools, of course, and a better understanding of yourself. Yeah. But you have to keep doing it, and from that, I think one of the most powerful things I've learned and I, I struggle to articulate is just acceptance I think acceptance is like as corny as it sounds it's the key to mm. life key to happiness because happiness is a spectrum and for me it's about I accept sometimes that I just don't want to go out some days and just I accept that I don't fight it and fight it I shouldn't feel like this I should want to go to my restaurant I should want to go out and social I just, like some days and it's not me falling into a pit of depression or anything mm. it's sometimes I just don't want to do fucking like normal shit I just want to have five six hours on my own mm. and accepting that is a key and then accepting that sometimes you're going to be happy sometimes you're not happiness isn't this ultimate goal that you'll get you achieve this this and that happy rest of your life it's up and down and dealing with it and accepting with the fact I'm gonna feel shit some days we all will like that doesn't always mean there's something deeply wrong it just means if I can accept that I'm not gonna fight it and I'm gonna come back sooner so we even like some things I'd learned to practice with myself is like because I would always you know from you know from things I'd experienced in my younger years it was like just burying this anything that was negative bury it bury it I don't want it I don't need it it's negative it was all there uh, but what I do now is I you know it's really hard thing to do is when something you know shit happens or you're feeling shit you um, or you think about it like even if I'm on my own like I might be in the flat I think about it I might just be thinking it over I might sit and cry on my own I might sort of get to some sort of resolution with it but what happens every time I guarantee I'll feel better about it because I've actually started breaking it down and getting used to feeling like that and it's not about wallowing in self-pity or it's not about just feeling sad it's about listening to what your body's saying listen to what your head is saying listen to what's actually happening not dealing with it and trying to solve it but if you don't shun it away you're going to feel a bit better about it because you've not just, you know, thrown it under the, um, swept it under the carpet. So like, it might be like, like it, it, I did it more. I don't do it so much now. Um, did it more like the, was it the second lockdown, like that last winter one? So it's like, I, was, I had two really polar opposite sides of the week. So I'd have my kids generally like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Monday to Wednesday. And we couldn't go out. We couldn't do anything, as you know. And everyone was in the same boat. And it was great. I had a really intense time with the kids. And it was great. It was a small flat. We couldn't go to the park or anything because it was winter. Um, it was homeschooling. So it was, it was intense and just trying to keep them happy. And then on a Wednesday afternoon, I dropped them back to their mum. And I'd get back to the flat and it was like one extreme to the other. And I'd feel this like twinge. And rather than just be like, oh, I'm fine, I'll go and then go to my girlfriend's or, or, or something or watch telly. I'd be like, no, no, listen to that. Sit down, listen, don't put anything on, and just, just listen to yourself. It's, it sounds simple, but it, it's not. It's not simple. Just listen to yourself. Just sit with it. I think you've touched on something so important there about that acceptance thing. Mm. Yeah, I think that's because we fight so hard, don't we, to, like you said, we should feel like this. We yeah, can, that should word again, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's like a constant conflict. Mm. And you know, it's someone said this to me years ago, like that. You know, depression is often when you argue with reality, and it's you know. And I understand it now. I mm -hmm. can see how that's so damaging when you try and argue reality, and when you know, if you can get to that point of like, Jeff Thompson used to call it surrender, just surrender to how it is. Like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it never made sense to me until until now. So I think that's a great point. What does success look like for you now? Uh, it's a lot different to what it used to be. <clears throat> I suppose it's probably a bit more materialistic when I was younger, success, which, you know, it's just not true, is it? You know, it, yes, it's nice to have nice things, but they're just little spikes of excitement that don't last. Um, for me, it's like, I'm, I'm not into all, gen generally not into quotes and things like that. Um, you know, some people post them and I think they, they can be a bit diluted if you go a bit mad with inspirational quotes. For me, it has to really mean something. And I actually just, it's something I, that I would never normally do, but this reaches me so much that I've done it. So we just had a refurb at the restaurant and um, we had this mirror put on the wall and there's a quote on it. And I would never have thought I've had a quote in a restaurant, but it's from one of my favorite all-time chefs. 
And all it says is um, success is measured by the memories we create. And like that's enough for me. It might not mean anything to anyone else, but for me it does. Because it just sums up, I think, some ways where what my path's been of like success on a materialistic level of Michelin star restaurant, cookbooks, things I am still proud of. Yeah. And a success in a, a career sense. Um, but they're not really, my kids don't give a shit that I've got a Michelin star. They don't know what it is. They don't care. Like, and you know, the first book, they've got the picture in. They're happy because they've got a picture in it. And the next one, the second book, they, they, they moan the picture's not in it. So they don't care that. They, they want me to be there with them, yeah. present and engaged. So success is measured by the memories we create. That is just that success to me. I think it can mean slightly different things to other people, but yeah, you, you're like, that, yeah, that reached me, that. What's the most disappointing materialistic item you've ever bought and straight away you're like, fucking hell. Like, that's such a disappointment for me. Ah, I don't know, really. my big truck. My big, oh, right, my okay. My truck. And I drove out the showroom knowing I was so fucking depressed. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, oh, so wow. I dropped like 25 grand on this truck. Oh, big wow. Big money. And I bought the fucking thing as well. <laughs> drove out, I was like, I knew. I knew when I was handing the money over, I was like, this is not going to make your life any better. You know no. That, yeah. And the other voice was going, ah, come on, fuck it, you deserve this drug. You work hard. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But all yeah. the memories that I could have created with that, that's what disappointed me in myself. Yeah. Like all those memories that I could have created with that 25 adventure, travel. Mm. So, so, yeah, what, what, what would you say? Oh, Sorry. it's really hard. Um, yeah, not really sure. There's definitely been some along the way. Um, I've, not, I've not chucked out that much for something. Um, it's probably been more little technology things like getting a new phone and trying to be excited for this new iPhone. It's exactly the fucking same as the rest. But, you know, for a techno geek, there might be some little things, but I don't know that stuff. But you build yourself up for these things and it's exactly the same because the phone looks the same or... Um, I'm trying to think of some other examples, but he's yeah, definitely on that small level materialistic sort of things or things I've bought for the flat that I think I'm going to love, like pieces of furniture. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it doesn't, it's not fulfillment. Fulfillment is something that's real and you get from engaging with people and experiences, right? Not goods. Yeah. You no, know? Totally, totally. Where does your ambition come? kind of come from now so if you're at this place where you know you know what's important to you and success has changed like how do you now stay driven and motivated especially inside of the business world for me I have to approach it in a different way the business I want the business to still be successful financially and I want it to grow and like I know it's not going to grow unless I step away a little bit more which is it's been a really hard transition, and you know my team are fine. You know they're cooking lunch now, and I'm I'm not there. They don't they don't need me there. Um, the detachment is my my issue because it's personal to me. So the success of the business now, well, the, my ambition comes from wanting to make it into a place that can run and operate without any real need from me apart from dipping in and out. So that's my ambition now. It's not about slaving over a stove. I don't get excited by service anymore. I used to, I find it boring now. I love cooking at home and just cooking nice things. And I love the pro, I'll always love that process of cooking, but not from a um, sort of career level like now. There's the chefs my age and older that still buzz off service and going in and getting set up and doing a service. It but bit bores me. I want to. I want to. My ambition is to just grow the business, make it successful in the sense that something where I can have a good life for me and the children. You know, get a better house. I don't want a big flash mansion, but something that's um, something that they're going to be happy. Where we can create memories. Yeah. And that this is where my ambition is now. Is what can I? How can I make my career better to impact my family life better? There was a quote that I read on the podcast that you'd done a while ago, um, and I might butcher this quote, so forgive me, but you said something, and I wonder if your attitude is still the same. To be brilliant at something, or to be the best, you have to be obsessed. Yeah, okay, what, what, what uh, podcast was that? Oh, mate, I'm sorry, I should have grabbed the source. So, yeah. Or it was, a, it was an interview online. An interview, uh, okay. Online, so I'll check that out. And it was you and another guy, I think it might have been the, the guy you were talking about. Do you yeah. still stand by that? I think in some respects, yeah, because yeah. you, you do, you have to be... 
Um, I think that was quite a recent one actually on our podcast. Um, it might have been, yeah. It was a standout headline, so I'm sorry I should have got the source, but it was just something like, yeah, to, you know, to be the best. Basically, you, you've got to be obsessed. You've got to go that extra mile. And you do, and I, I'm not obsessed with being the best anymore. Okay. And I, th- I think that's where I've changed, but I still believe in that. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't have got the restaurant to where it is without the team. Yeah. Obviously, they've done massive, massive amounts for it, but without me being obsessed and driving it to where it wants to be. And it's like if you want to be, if you're a footballer. Like, look at, you know, our era of growing up, like with David Beckham. Yeah. Like, he was the best crosser of the ball in the world, best, like, dead ball, you know, specialist. He wasn't just good at that. Yes, he had some natural ability, and he didn't just plod in and do, you know, 30 hours a week. He wanted to be the best, so he stayed later and he worked harder, worked harder than everyone else, practiced free kicks after um, training. So he wanted to be the best. So if you do, it's not all about natural ability. You can have some natural ability, but you have to work hard if you want to be the best in that way. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I do totally endorse that still, but it's not where I'm at. Yeah. Well, I think you, I think you've done it, haven't you? And I think like to, I believe anyway to get like in your twenties and thirties is the best time to to go all in on that because I think yes. you learn so many lessons. You've got that energy. You you probably got the time. You know, most people in their young twenties don't have kids and stuff. Less risk in that sense. It's less risk. It, you know, it's a good time to become obsessed with something. So yeah. I think that's a constant battle, isn't it? With especially driven entrepreneurs, it's like well. You know, how much time do I, you know, I do want to be the best, but if I'm going to give the best of my business, mm. like, ultimately I have to sacrifice time with the kids, the family, and I think that balancing act, it's like, does it even exist? Like, can you balance things, or do you make a decision in life, you go, my business is my number one. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, I think guys get guilty when they do that, but if we're talking about values and what you really love, mm. some love, some people love creating things, creating businesses, and it makes yeah. them happy, therefore they can go home and they can be a good person because they're content and they're peaceful. I always like to think of it as parent, I mean, I'm not a parent, so you, you can tell me otherwise here, but I always think that like, quality is better than quantity when it comes to relationships. Oh God, so yeah. So yeah. even if yeah. you don't see your kids seven days a week and you only see them twice, like you can give them two fucking great days, right? Mm. And that's more important than the guy who's with them seven days a week, who's on his phone watching TV. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, you're right with that. Yeah. Totally agree with that. And I didn't, I didn't quite appreciate that when you know I was having issues with moving out of the family home and seeing the kids less. Now I do a really good amount of time with them. So yeah, you, yeah, you're totally right. Um, like what I'd say with that is like, obviously, I agree with that statement massively about wanting to be the best the only thing i wouldn't change anything about my Mm. sort of career at all because you know i'm in a good place and where i am now so i don't believe like in regrets in that respect um but the one thing i would do is just ask not my younger self but anyone out there if anyone's listening to this if they are in their 20s 30s and they're whatever their field they want to be the best just ask yourself why you want to be the best because that's going to help you realise if you genuinely do, is it is it competition, is it bravado, is it genuine, do you gen- genuinely want to achieve in that? Because I, I think it's really important. I couldn't have answered that in my 20s or 30s. I just wanted to be the best I could be, the best chef I could be, you know. Didn't want to be the best chef in the world, so I kind of knew that's, that's very impractical and, you know, subjective to some level as well. Um, but I think it's an important thing to ask yourself, like, why do I want to do this? before you know maybe you get down there down the road not necessarily having failures it's not about the fact sometimes like me you get to you achieve the things you want and you're a bit flat it's like it's not what i expected like ask yourself why do you think there's any other way of educating yourself though other than to go there do those things work that hard get those rewards and then work out because would you have listened to you when you're <laughs> no, no you're right fuck off I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. on a mission mate yeah no so, no you're right and you know experience is much better yeah. sort of lesson to anyone isn't it I think so I'm kind of glad oh, I hope I've put my biggest mistakes I hopefully are done hopefully yeah. because I've yeah. made some big ones but okay I think whether you call it a midlife crisis or what but I like to think that when you're in your late 30s early 40s you've still got time Mm-hmm. Not to correct necessarily, but to you know live a good life. Yeah. Regardless of what you've done, and I don't care what anyone says about age is just a number. Yeah, it is. But I think the older you get, the harder it is. Like if you're seventy and you've spent an unfulfilled life and you've mm-hmm. done some things that you're really not proud of, 
I don't know, I don't know what you think, but I can't imagine sitting there at 70 and going, yeah, I'm going to change my life now. I just, I, my mindset, I don't think would take me there. No. So I think it's a good time to review the, the younger you are, if you can ask these big questions and get around people maybe that are a bit wiser than you. I love speaking to coaches and mentors. Yeah. So, you know, this is why I was so excited to speak to you today because I was like, <coughs> I'm going to learn something. Yeah. I'm going to learn something. And I have from, you know, that, the, the stories of the therapy for two years and how you spent so much time reflecting. Mm. Um, if someone's listening to this then, like, um, and we'll kind of like try and give out a little bit of practical stuff here if anyone wants to kind of absorb this information. And they're there and they have those similar feelings, you know, and fulfillment, not knowing who I am. Mm. Aside from therapy, like, what would you say are the most important things somebody does to either start the journey or start to understand more about themselves and who they are? Yeah, I'd say you've got you've got to keep it simple. You've got to, again, it, on a, it's so simple on the surface, Rob. It's not simple in practice. So the, the biggest key is listen to yourself. We've all been in situations where, whether it's a, a job or, or something where, I'm trying to think of an example, but I'm going to explain it the best way I can. You, you Say you're in a job and you know deep down it's not quite right for you, it's not the best for you, but there's other things that are stopping you from doing what you want to do and leave, whatever it might be, whether it's guilt, whether it's the should word or something, or whether it's family or something holding you back for whatever it is. You got, the best advice I could offer is listen to yourself, take some time out and just ask yourself why you're doing the things you're doing. Like, what is the pursuit? It's not always about the end goal, because again, that's like it goes back to what I was saying in the future. Like, uh, sorry, earlier on, in the future isn't real because it hasn't happened yet. We can all dream and we can all have goals, and I think they're important, but we can get so carried away with that mm-hmm. and forget the present. So, listen to you now, you'll be a different you in 10 years. You're a different you to you were 10 years ago. <clears throat> sorry, losing my voice today. <laughs> um, <laughs> listen to you now because that's all that matters it doesn't you know, you've hopefully learned from who you were before you don't know who you're going to be in the future listen to who you are now and that will shape you who you are listen to what you're genuinely feeling the reasons why you're doing what you're doing and you're going to make better life decisions not always right no none, none of us are going to uh, rather than you know all of us guilty of it you've uh, yeah, acting on the hop making decisions because we don't have that uh, risk or people relying on us or no one beholden to us you really listen to yourself and what you're actually feeling and why you're putting yourself in positions why you're making those decisions why you're taking that job why you're taking that path it doesn't have to be that in depth but do the things that are going to be good for you do you if you catch yourself like doing shoulds now like oh, i should do this i should do that do you now stop and question things Probably, <laughs> I nearly said it then. I was going to say, <laughs> not as much as I should. <laughs> do, you, do you catch yourself? Now? I do, yeah, 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 I do. And, you know, it's something that's inherent in our vocabulary, so it's hard to remove. And you've got to accept that, yeah, I'll, I'll use it sometimes. But you've got to understand what that means. And it's as bad saying it of yourself as it is to someone else, you know, because the should word dismisses somebody's feelings straight away. You should have done this. Mm, that you know that when you really think about it it's a really negative thing to say isn't it because one you're dismissing what they've done two you're telling them they're not good enough and three you're saying I know better than you but you're looking from like hindsight so it's a really bad thing to say but with yourself it becomes even more a critical word because you're just beating on yourself I should have done this or I should be doing that it's it's bad it's such a powerful word that is really unheard I agree man um Dude, there's two questions that are a bit of tradition for me to ask, so I'm going okay. to wrap up with those in a minute. Before I do, though, there's something I wanted to ask at the start, so yeah. it might interrupt the flow a little bit, but no, I, know okay. no, I know nothing about food, right? I'm a, okay. I'm a PT <laughs> meathead, dude, so meat, like, <laughs> porridge in the morning with protein powder in, yeah. uh, like some kind of meat with rice and broccoli, and then I'll have steak or whatever at night, so I'm very plain, I like very simple food. What's the difference between me going to like a, a great restaurant, you know, where the food's good, the service is good, the restaurant's nice, and then Michelin star restaurant. Like, mm. what, what's, the, what's the difference? Like, what is a Michelin star restaurant? So Michelin star, it's ultimately, and what Michelin say, it's about, it's about the food. And now they, they don't tell you what they're looking for. You know what they're looking for because it's got to be 
exceptional and consistent and it's got to be very personal to them you shouldn't really be able to get it elsewhere if that makes sense um it should be delivering you know the best the highest quality ingredients sourcing the best ingredients treating them with the utmost respect and deliver executing them consistently like season you know cooked um <clears throat> all of those different things and you should you should have an experience and it's different when you get from one star to two star to three star like i can't tell you what a three star restaurant is the only way i can say is you know when you're in a free mission star restaurant i've been to a few and you know you're in a free mission star restaurant you just that is a feeling and michelin kind of say that as well like i've been to the best meal i've ever had was in sweden in stockholm free mission star restaurant called franson it just delivered on every single level. I was there for lunch for like six hours. It was just incredible. Six hours? Yeah. It was just a full experience. And you ju you just know it's three star. It is nothing else but three star. You know, and you, you kind of know two star, it's that in between. Like it should have a real personal identity to a two star. And you should be able to see that chef's food and know that that's, that's Tom Kerridge's food. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that, that's yeah. of him. Okay. Or... You know, there's so many copycat chefs out there. I'll be like, that's a poor version of Tom Kerridge's food. That's a poor version of Sat Bain's food. Like, because they've seen it on Instagram or eating in a restaurant mm. and done a bastardized version. And one star, it kind of, in the same, again, it's like you're in, you know, the top point, you know, one percent of the industry. And that's where you are. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of great restaurants and restaurants I love that don't have mission stars. Mm. And they potentially could. That's not their MO and what they're after. But but they, they, they just don't. And it is hard to distinguish sometimes. Um, and again, there's good restaurants I like to go to. You know they're not one star. They're not good enough to be one star, but you're still going to have a great time. Yeah, I see you post out a lot of cool like places that you visit on Insta and I like, yeah. I like following that. I, like, I always say I'm going to go and try those. So, mate, this is, uh, I always get embarrassed like saying this. I have been to a Michelin style restaurant, but do you know what? I ordered burger and chips. Oh, no. In Where'd Balbast. you go? It was one in Balbast. Oh, right. Okay. It's fucking nice, though. Well, yeah, yeah. There's nothing wrong with burger chips. Cook yeah, nicely. There's nothing wrong at all with burger and chips. No, the only no. thing wrong with it is I eat too much of it. <laughs> I just love it, dude. And one of the reasons why I haven't come into salt is I've got a peanut allergy, right? And I feel, I don't know why. I feel I have an issue with coming into a Michelin star restaurant and going, I've got an allergy. Like, can you can you make sure that because I always feel like it's like this is what we serve. Oh, okay. And I could be totally yeah, wrong here. And no, that's that what you get. that most Michelin star restaurants are fine with that. Okay. Most are. You know, we're fine with it. We do have certain restrictions. Like, I won't. We don't cook for vegans. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm totally fine with that. <laughs> as as, yeah. <laughs> and that that isn't just about. You know, I've just released a cookbook that's how to cook meat yeah, properly. I, that, yeah. I love meat, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not about my personal decision. It's genuinely a business decision, right? Because, you know, we have one taster menu at night. Yeah. It's like eight courses and then there's snacks and there's petty fours and yeah. there's like this amazing butter with your bread. Um, if it's a Thursday, right, and we've got we have a vegan book for the Friday, we've got to do everything different. So that adds another three hours work to my team. Yeah, I get it. For one or two vegans every few months. Like, and then... I know they're not all the same, but we're never going to get hardcore vegans come to my restaurant, right? We're, we're meat heavy and fish heavy. So we get these part-timers and you see it a lot. We spend all this time cooking food for them. And then you see them eat some of their partner's cheese because we've got this open kitchen and it's mortifying because, and it does, it makes you very cynical as well. Yeah. You know, wow. right, rightly or wrongly, you do become cynical of it. So it's like a business decision. We don't need to cook for vegans we're an 11 table restaurant we're open four days a week we're niche we're not trying to please everybody and i'm genuinely fine if people don't like the food we yeah. we're good i know we're good we don't i'm fine if you don't like it. it's just not for you uh we don't cook for anyone dairy intolerant because that's pretty much the same as doing vegan we use so much butter and cream etc um and then the rest of it it's you know we're, we're quite flexible really cool man yeah. yeah, I'm gonna have to come down and try it. Yeah, I've got no idea do. what to expect. Again, it's just like I say, my upbringing just—we just never went near Michelin yeah, star. Neither did I no, until I sure, like yeah. worked in one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm interested to know. I've never tasted um, proper food. I've never had like what you would call proper like Michelin star quality food ever. Oh, okay. Never. I'm not a fancy eater, dude. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm, I can steak, potatoes, and veg. 
Which yeah, I proper old school. So I'd love to part you, of my trying to open up and experience uh, life a bit more. As Michelin restaurants are, you know, we're a great one for somebody like yourself that's never been to one because we're so relaxed. There's no dress code, and, and I hate that kind of thing. Okay, you know, so somebody come might come in, you know shirt jeans trainers and somebody might be really dressed up on a table next to them and it doesn't look out of place because mm-hmm. it's not a grand dining room it's a lovely dining room really relaxed um it's loud it's got a really good atmosphere my staff treat people like people they're not robots that just deliver a job um so we are much more approachable for that reason that i you know i don't um you know i don't want a certain set of people coming i don't just want the rich to come in it's it's for everyone Oh. Well, if, if you're cooking one night and then one of, the, one of the service people come in and say, there's a guy who's asked for a fucking burger. In <laughs> like, I know who that, fucking, I know who that guy is. So a couple of, couple of traditional questions. What's next for Paul Foster? Ah, loads, loads. Let's hear it, man. I mean, I am like, I know we talked about like stopping mm. earlier, which was really important. And yeah, I am really busy now, but I'm, I manage myself and can stop myself now which is important um so salt's just gone for a big refurb new kitchen so that's you know in a good place now um i'm writing another book my third cookbook which um, i'm starting soon so with the range is a series of six books okay so the first one was how to cook meat properly the next one's how to cook pasta properly so it's gonna be pasta rice uh gnocchi grains all those sort of things so really content heavy book and so i'm going to go through them through the series so right in that i need to start it as soon as possible i've not not started it yet okay. um and then a restaurant in london soon as well oh really yeah oh, and that's then exciting. the podcast as well so i've got all these titles at the moment that it's just like restaurateur chef author podcaster yeah so it's a bit what it's do you like talking about now? Like, do, you, do, you, do you love talking about food or do you love talking about food and like, what we've done today, for example? Like, will you keep it a food topic theme? Um, I mean, I value this much more, okay. this kind of thing. And that's yeah. the way our podcast has gone. So we wanted, similar to you, we wanted it to be about authentic conversation. Yeah. Our sort of escort platform is chefs, if you like, because I can relate to them and our experiences. So we've got really well-known chefs, um, you know, small restaurant chefs, hotel chefs, some off telly. The premise was like, we want to get these chefs that you'll see on television and you see this persona, you see mm-hmm. this food, you think you know them and people abuse them online like anyone that's famous. But we we don't really want to talk about that. We want to talk about your career and the, the nuts and bolts of it and the things you've been through and the real life experiences. So it's it's emotive sometimes, it's funny, we have a really good laugh and yeah. it's just genuine conversation. We called it the nightcap because like from me growing up in a pub, um, I loved the stay back. You know, when I was 10 years old, I'd sneak down and try and, you know, listen to all the conversation that I shouldn't have been listening to. Because um, I love the whole lock in stay back thing. Yeah. So we've created that. We, we don't do it on Zoom because we want this engagement like me and you have got today. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we give them dinner at the restaurant. They have a couple of drinks, relax, they come up to the cookery school above the restaurant. Um, and we just chat and have a drink. And it's great like like that like doing that it kind of coincided with my therapy and stuff and it's just been i've it's really helped me realize the importance of conversation and just relating it to that i don't i don't get really deep on there not as deep as i've got with you today but we allow people the space to like you have today with me yeah. you've allowed me the space and you know made sure. me feel safe comfortable that you can be vulnerable and we kind of allow that the, the podcast whilst we tell funny stories and i always tell different ones um we want them to be able to talk yeah. and chat and you know be themselves and we give them the space it's not about us really yeah, yeah. No, i think that's good i mean i was even, you know even messaging you i was like michelin star restaurant owners you're really going to want to come and talk to me and then you <laughs> meet you and you're just so down to earth normal guy and it's just oh, so thank refreshing you. No, it's, yeah. it's, made, it's, been, it's, it's been a pleasure like and i was so excited part of the excitement for me is not knowing what you're going to say yeah so like you know some podcasts are a bit scripted yeah, like I do a bit of homework, but I'm just genuinely excited to be like sitting opposite and like picking brains and hearing yeah. stories, and I just find it fascinating. No, so. I really like your style. Like the, you've, yeah, I know you've got some notes written down, but you've not gone right. Question one, question I, two, really question three. Off. It's because that is that becomes a journo sure. interview, yeah. and again, like relating back to our podcast and like. We didn't want it to be like that. Often, loads of interviews for the catering press where it's like, "What was your inspiration?" What is the same, same, same? And it's hard to get deep. But no, I like your style that you've just 
you've rolled and let the conversation flow and I think it's a really really good thing for people to listen to have you always stayed this authentic because it hasn't been hard work I haven't felt like I've had to break like any barriers down like, have you always been like this because you know you go on your Instagram you've got a large following you, there's mm. pictures of you with some pretty well famous chefs and you're like <laughs> oh shit like, this guy's the real deal like, <laughs> but like have you, have, you had, have you had to move past any of that or have you always been this relaxed and open and- um, no I haven't Again, it's a result of everything we spoke about today okay. that I've just, you know, the floodgates kind of open and, yeah. um, you know, I'm fine just talking about it. I don't, you know, I don't worry about what people are going to think or say um, anymore. I used to. I was, um, I've always been honest, but I, th- I think if I think back now to any interviews I've done pre all this lot, all this sort of issues and stuff. I would have been like honest, but there was to a level that I wasn't even aware of. This subconscious level that I never passed, and I was honest about my career and experiences, but never about. I never spoke about me, like Paul. I never spoke about me. It was Paul the chef. That was it, really. I didn't really see the it's bizarre. How I feel more com- comfortable speaking on a podcast mm. about stuff than I do like on a one-to-one private convo. It's, it's fucking insane. I'm like, how does that work? People are listening to this. Isn't it mad? It's crazy. I'm like talking like nobody's going to listen. Yeah. People will listen. Yeah. And yet you're saying things that you just wouldn't normally talk about. Even when you mates down the pub, you just wouldn't talk about it. It's crazy. I haven't worked out why. I don't know. And like, it's mad. Just think, reflecting on what you've said then, like we're in this place now. Where there's loads of people here. They obviously can't hear us. But you take these mics away in that window. We're in a coffee shop. Mm-hmm first time I've met you, imagine how mental it would be just speaking to a guy you've never met on this level in a coffee shop. We've put some mics in and it it changes. It's great. It is great. It's fucking great, great, yeah. But you think it'd be the opposite. I mean, look how official it is. There's there's free cameras here. Yeah. Mics around. It's like, this is a bit, but it's not. It's it's, it's bizarre. Mm. I'm not sure what, I haven't worked out at all. I can't even get close to describing why that would happen what's happening to the communication. Yeah, I, d- I don't know, I don't know, idea. yeah. Right, mate, sorry, I said there was two final questions. That's one of them. Finally, so obviously it's the Better Man podcast. So what does Paul Foster have to work on now to become a better man? I think just carry on with my journey, like work on the same things, like reflecting back to what we said earlier, you're never done. You're never like, right, I'm fixed now. Um, and you're never, you know, you're never completely broken either you know, to, to hopefully try and give some people some good peace of mind that, you, you know, there's always opportunity. There's always something you can work on. And I think for me, it's the same things. Keep you know, focusing on being present in the time, present with the people I want to be with and using my time in the right way and just and just making life better for me. Because if I like make things better for me, genuinely, it's better for everyone, better for my kids, better for my girlfriend, better for my friends, better for my staff. It's... You know, I think you just create this sort of. Um, I don't really think what the what the phrase is, but you you just create this way of life that is positive, not that fake positive, a like real positive that helps other people as well. Because like I said earlier, my, my kids don't want me just unengaged and uninterested, and focused on you know businesses and all this other stuff. They want me. That you know, whilst they're still young, until they get teenager and like, you know, <laughs> um, you know, they want the dad, you know, and it's it's really easy to forget that, and it's no one's fault if they do. It's you know, you don't need to beat yourself up. We just need to focus on what's important. Man, I think that's a beautiful way to end. Thank you. What a pleasure. No, thanks for having I'll, me. Uh, you'll see me down at Salt Restaurant. Yeah, good. Mate, good thank you.